Um, as we get going here, I just want to say uh, what an um, honor and a pleasure it is for me to be up here, to be here with this uh, panel of uh, speakers that we've had already this morning, uh, and the speakers will be coming here later. And it definitely is a pleasure to be speaking about such a fascinating person as Carl Henry. Uh, these past few months, my entire academic life has been dominated by the study of him, by the study of this fascinating human being. And repeatedly throughout this time, as I've been going through his books and sermons and lectures, uh, each time I hear something new of him, read something new of him, I realize that I'm confronted by an immense mind. It is just astonishingly rare to find someone with such great breadth of interests and knowledge combined with the depth of analysis on so many different issues. And here's a man who came from such humble beginnings as you wouldn't think possible uh, to rise to become one of the chief spokesmen of evangelicalism at a time when it itself, evangelicalism itself, was rising from relative obscurity up into national and even international prominence. It was a man who could write an extensive six-volume work, God, Revelation, and Authority, on such you know, high abstract issues, you know, epistemology, pneumatology, all sorts of ideologies. Yet he would take the time when speaking at Christian conferences to ask people if they truly knew Christ. One sermon I listened to, he gave three separate altar calls. Now, as a Presbyterian, that was definitely very weird for me to hear. Uh, I don't know how many times I've heard just as I am when listening through these sermons. Um, but when we see these things, uh, it, it is just a pleasure to, see, uh, to, to, to encounter him in those places, to learn from him, and to follow his example. And so it is definitely my pleasure to share some of what I have learned of this man's past to you today in the present. Now, one of the things I've most enjoyed about being an historian is the way that I get to look over the shoulder of someone from another time and another place and see, if only for a hazy moment, what the world looked like to them. Uh, even when the people under my microscope might seem like they're relatively close to my own vantage point, there are always those places where I'm forced to realize what a wide gulf lies between my own life, my own experience, and theirs. Now, most of the time, it is simply a matter of humor and puzzlement, though sometimes there's those re revolting things as well, ideas that people have had in the past. But the, we are c constantly confronted with the idea that those things which, in one day or one era, are, are simply a matter of fact or utterly unremarkable, uh, may be inexplicable or quite literally yesterday's news to another time. Now, whether it be car ads from 30, 40 years ago arguing that it is, this year, it is this year's model that is the best of all possible automotive worlds, tail fins and all, or if it's more substantial things uh, like religious and political ideas, um, the, the givens, the assumptions of one period or one group within another era are often inexplicable to another. Now, when we look back at those other times or at other groups, we hopefully have that voice in the backs of our brains reminding us that just as we, they seem so strange to us, so one day or even today, someone looking back upon us will look at our prides and joys and have the same, will, will have the same experience of seeing how strange we seem to them. Now, most of the time, this is just a matter of, as I said, it's a matter of humor, puzzlement. It's just a, a, there's a distance you must get used to. But it's not always the case that it's that innocent. Now, one place where we see this disconnect between one group's self-perception and the image put forward elsewhere is the way in which evangelicals come across in the popular and academic uh, image in the world, imagination in the world. In many ways, evangelicals uh, can see their, the, the image portrayed of them in popular and academic culture be to be entirely at odds with what they experience with the people they go to church with on Sundays. It's just two separate, there's the imaginary one and there's the real one that they encounter. Now, this is hardly a new phenomenon. You look back at the 1920s, and what do you see? You see Sinclair Lewis writing his famous novel, Elmer Gantry, where he's uh, uh, deriding the, the, basically the mental competence of much of the general religious population and questioning the moral credibility of religious leaders. By 1960, you move on and you see with Inherit the Wind, one of the many incarnations of Inherit the Wind, you see Spencer Tracy boldly standing up against uh, religious irrationality in this fictionalized account of the Spokes mon Scopes Monkey Trial. Not the Spokes Monkey Trial, that'd be something else. The Scopes Monkey Trial. Like some mustache twirling uh, villain of the uh, silent film era, the, the theological conservative uh, leader has become a standardized villain in much of popular culture. 
Now, on the one hand, there, there's only so much we can make of this. We can't take it all that seriously. After all, we can see back in the 1990s in the hit TV show The X-Files, there was the time where one of their oh-so-educated special agents told the other about the time in the Bible where St. Ignatius practiced teleportation. <laughs> I must have missed that part of Third Peter as I was going along there. Now, trying, I mean, this just goes to show you that trying to get an accurate, accurate picture of a religious reality from movies and TV is like, as others have said, is trying to get an understanding of physics from watching a Bugs Bunny cartoon. There's just a definite disconnect there. However, particularly at those times when it's discussing uh, national security and foreign policy issues, this caustic image of evangelicals uh, has escaped its confines of the silver screen and made it into the journalistic and academic works uh, chronicling evangelicalism. Now, for a great many of these books, all it takes is for me to recite some of the names of recent, all of these in the last 10, 15 years, of books about theological conservatives as they seek to describe what the people in this room would think. You have, for instance, American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War on America, or American Theocracy, The Peril and Politics of Radical Religion, Oil and Borrowed Money in the 21st Century, or The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power. Or we have my favorite, with God on our side, one man's war against an evangelical coup in, the US, in America's military. Now this last work has in its concluding chapter the following question concerning evangelism within the military. Is it really such a stretch to extrapolate spiritual warfare into the realm of actual bullets and bloodshed? Are we at risk of arming and equipping an army of our own fanatics single-mindedly focused on ushering in the kingdom of God by converting or killing every last unbeliever? This isn't my formulation. The evangelical credo is clear on this point. The gospel must be preached to all the world. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. That's a mission of conquest. Now granted, this is from rather the extreme end of critical uh, books discussing evangelicalism, flowing from the pens of activists and journalists. But there have been other works which have come out in recent years uh, from a more formal academic nature that in their own way are just as negative. Uh, while, these, uh, while these previous authors, the, the activists and journalists, uh, have tended to show theological conservatives as interested in foisting a uh, religiously based tyranny upon the nation, these more academic works tend to show them uh, as more ignorant and misguided, uh, letting their, uh, their theological, the religious zeal uh, to make them be uncritical in the view of the United States and its foreign policy goals. For example, one author of a, a book just recently, uh, actually just the last year, used the term Manichaean uh, repeatedly throughout his work to describe the way evangelicals saw the global situation in the Cold War as a stark and simple choice between the forces of good and light, the United States and its allies, and the forces of darkness and evil, the Soviet Union and its minions. Uh, it, at one point he used the term three times in just the space of two pages to describe Billy Graham and his fellows. Another author chose the word monolithic uh, as his mantra describing evangelicals' apparent inability uh, to appreciate the intricacies involved in the Cold War. Now what these two books had in common was when they wrote of those Christians who tended to support the general gist of US foreign policy initiatives, they spoke of them as just simply going along with nationalistic currents uh, and uh, as practicing what they call governmental theism. While those who tended to oppose American uh, foreign policy goals were described as being reflective and being aware of the complexity of the situation whether it's because they were overcome by their premillennial dreams and apocalyptic nightmares, as one author has put it, um, uh, one of, in her title, or they're simply unwilling or unable uh, to have any critical perspective on the world. Evangelicals come across in these books as all too susceptible to a Christian nationalism, uncritically conjoining the cross of Christ and the stars and stripes. Now, it is not as though there is no basis for such an opinion. Everyone in this room could probably cite a time when we have seen people do just this, which are criticized for, for being nationalistic. And we probably all could say a time when we have done it ourselves. Um, back in the Second World War, when the, when the greatest generation fought against the Axis powers, Christians were prone as, just as, any, were prone as any other group to conflate the issues. In 1942, one Christian magazine published the following poem that could at least confuse its readers about the relationship between the Kingdom of God and the United States. Each star upon this noble flag which we present tonight speaks proudly of a patriot's love for justice, truth, and right. Each star a soldier, brave and true, resolved his best to give, that we who honor liberty and freedom still may live. A star, each star a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb, enlisted in a cause for which his captain came. 
May God in, in mercy richly bless these valiant boys, we pray. And as they serve their country's flag, may they serve him always. Now, as fitting a conference uh, celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Henry, we could have few, if any, better test cases for whether or not this impression of evangelicals is, in fact, definitive. As a key figure in the formation and the development of the evangelical mind, he provided thoughtful commentary on, about socio-political and national security issues uh, from the earliest days of the Cold War uh, down to its final years in order to gain a better understanding of the significance of evangelical ethics related to foreign policy as seen in his thought, I want to look at a sampling of Carl Henry's views in three basic groups of um, issues uh, dealing with, coming from three groups of his works. I want to see what he said about America, about nuclear weapons, and about communism uh, and this, from the 1950s to the 1980s. Now this will involve looking first at his 1952-1953 Pasadena radio show went on for about nine months. Uh, Let the Chips Fall is the name of that. Articles in Christianity Today during his editorship, which uh, carries us from 1956 to 1968. Uh, and then finally, uh, some gleanings from God, Revelation, and Authority, uh, published between 1976 and 1983, giving us thus the, the bulk of the Cold War. I would suggest to you that rather than exhibiting an uncritical advocacy of the United States during this tense time of the Cold War, Carl Henry manifested a complex view of global politics, where America, though relatively better than its Russian rivals, uh, was, it, was itself deeply flawed. His support of the U.S. and openness to nuclear weapons was not the result of seeing the world through red, white, and blue colored glasses or some sort of naivete about the awesome destructive power incumbent with uh, nuclear weapons. His opposition to communism did not flow from nationalistic xenophobia but from his firm belief in the innate dignity of every human being, a, digni a dignity confirmed, conferred by a power far higher than any nation, state, or ideology. To call him a patriot is undoubtedly fair, but as this affection for his country was tempered by classic Christian doctrines, we may best, as our title suggests today, call him a principal patriot. At the beginning of this period, in 1952, Dr. Henry displayed a qualified support for his native United States. As I said, of the two possible options in the Cold War rivalry, he saw America as the better choice. Even so, we do not see there the nationalism or militarism we might, we might be taught from some of the current literature going on. Did he think of this as God's chosen land and the source of the, uh, all that is good and noble in the world? Hardly. Though he had great hope for his country, arguing that it had been historically a Christian nation and that it had been created with the assumption of a divinely originating human dignity, he had no illusion about its purity or ultimate faith in its continue, or ultimate confidence in its continuing faithfulness. Speaking in 1953, he said, America, how far you have fallen from the dream of the founding fathers, how dreadfully you have drifted from the Christian philosophy of history, how far short you have stooped from the lofty spiritual objectives which they projected for this land. In response to a 1952 poll suggesting that 99% of Americans believed in God, his reply did not involve his own rendition of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. His statement was this, the vast majority of Americans today may believe in a ghost God, a phantom God, and a God who makes very little difference in the great decisions of life and even less in the cares of everyday existence. These must be non-Christian gods, non-biblical gods, who have little in common with the gods of our fathers, which many of these 99% of Americans worship. On another occasion, speaking a few weeks later, uh, on the drift of the world towards what he called irreligion, Dr. Henry argued that America itself was drifting away from a God-centered world to one where competing authorities clamored for attention. He warned, what happens to a world which is prone to store God away for future reference is that the deluge of judgment will overtake it before it repents of its sins and returns to a deep concern for the righteousness and preoccupation with moral earnestness. Far from seeing the United States is guaranteed of God's special blessing, he called upon America to repent of its sinful habits. Nor did he see political leaders or processes of, as absolute guardians of hope. He was quite willing to praise the initiative of particular leaders like President Eisenhower, both for his willingness to identify himself publicly with the church by joining a church and to pray at his own inauguration. But this support which Henry offered was not without qualification. After complimenting the new president for saying the nation needed to, quote, be strong above all in spiritual resources and, quote, in the values we defend, Henry went on to caution against vague religiosity, saying, but if the State of the Union message was indefinite and given over to generalization at any point, it was here. 
the very point upon which the salvation of the nation depends. At another time, Henry dismissed the possibility of putting trust in princes or American systems when he argued the healing of a nation's diseases comes not alone from political and economic programs or from a new administrative leadership. It comes from spiritual regeneration and moral renewal. The breakdown of morality and of spirituality in America calls the citizenry from false and changing gods to the living God, and the living God calls us to repentance. Far from viewing America as guaranteed a victory against its Russian opponents, he could see the Soviets, rather, as the potential hand of judgment against the United States. He said, God is not above a righteous use of one degenerate segment of humanity to destroy another degenerate segment. He can loose the fanatic hordes of Russian communism against us before he deals with the communists in another way. God does not need an unmoral answer to communism, for an unmoral answer is no answer, but only needs to be answered itself. When it came to that great threat of the 20th century atomic warfare, Henry offered up a largely negative evaluation, an evaluation which entailed potential guilt for the only nation thus far to have used the weapons. He stated that American political leaders had, quote, dropped the bomb, and if there was any guilt in the dropping of that bomb, in the sudden erasure of those Japanese lives, in the distorted features and ugly scars and suffering bodies, which we bequeath to a multitude of blistered survivors, we share in that guilt. At the close of that same year, he waxed despondently poetic when speaking of the end. We come to the end of another year. Somehow that phrase, the end, even if we only mean the end of 1952, has an ominous note about it these years. We never quite thought, a few decades ago, that the mere mention, mention of the phrase, the end, would any more set up such terrifying prospects in our minds. It was only yesterday that the man of the West, the man of Europe and the Americas, expected that tomorrow, or at least the day after tomorrow, would bring us a millennium on the Earth forged by the genius of modern science and the evolutionary improvement of human nature. Today, multitudes of people fear that tomorrow holds, instead of a millennium, the possibility of hell on Earth. Yet even as he considered the uh, potential horrors of a nuclear exchange, he did not rule out the possible ethical use of such devastating weaponry. He argued there may be time when circumstances, uh, uh, when circumstances demand uh, that uh, the destruction, which is part and parcel of these devices. He was emphatic, however, that the U.S. must make its ethical case clear both to itself and to the wider watching world. He said, we had better not let the world overhear us speaking about the use of atom bombs and hydrogen bombs against the communist might makes right philosophy without making it abundantly clear that in our case the superior might is being used because right requires it. Indeed, makes its use unavoidable and even makes a failure to discharge atom and hydrogen bombs over certain cities a wicked and immoral thing. We had better exhibit the ethical compulsion of such an act to the world and to our own people, or the dropping of these bombs, even if it should succeed in bringing us peace in our time, may do so by dulling what sense of moral alertness survives in the Western world, by precipitating us unexpectedly over the precipice of ethical chaos. Now, although there may have been some ambiguity and some back and forth, as you see, about both um, the United States and nuclear weapons, there was no such gray area when it came to communism. His opposition was universal and humanistic rather than merely nationalistic, as though he thought it was simply the un-American nature of Marxism which made it so repellent. He said this, we are face to, day, face to face today in the world with one of the most deceptive and vicious ideologies in the history of Western thought, a communistic philosophy which abandons persuasion and seeks to impose itself by force. At another time, he urged President-elect uh, Eisenhower to hold the line saying, we want leaders who see communism, th see through communism for what it is, a godless, naturalistic view of man and life, a totalitarianism which robs man of his created freedom and exposes him to the complete control of the state, a view which annuls man's dignity and worth and treats him only as a complex animal. Tellingly, his animus towards Marxism was not matched by a reciprocal love for American-style capitalism in and of itself. He said this in November of 1952, without its theological basis, without its orientation to God and the supernatural order, capitalism, the case for freedom, the assertion of human rights, will work themselves into a disguised enemy, a Judas that will, not, that will betray us to parties and alignments we do not now dream. Without God, they too will come under God's judgment and they'll prove themselves artificial alternatives to communism. They too will fall. His concern, therefore, was not that Americans would include capitalism or military force in their socio-political toolkit, but rather that these contingent things would take the place in the hearts of Americans that would be better suited a place for the creator. 
And he said this, But if we put our trust in the gods of this world, in money, in commerce, and in armaments, in these things alone, or in these things fundamentally, we may, maybe we can last a few centuries longer than Europe, but woe to you, America, the evil day. While the radio broadcast had been, by their very nature, aimed at a wide, uh, yet geographically localized audience, um, the, the intended readers of Christianity Today uh, comprise a more narrow clerical audience and a far more widespread geographical uh, uh, readership across the continent. Just as he had done with his radio show, Dr. Henry asserted in his editorials uh, that the American-led free world uh, was the better of the two warring blocs. Yet he questioned the long-term efficacy of the West's worldview. In the introductory issue, he said this, uh, wrote this, Beyond doubt, the Western view of human, of, of human dignity and human rights presupposes a worthier uh, outlook on life than does the communist devaluation of man. Yet, he saw this superstructure as on an, resting on an inadequate foundation. It was not enough, he argued, merely to advocate political liberty as though this would endure in the absence of religious and economic liberty. At its core, Dr. Henry saw the philosophical position of the democratic West vis-a-vis -vis the communist East as far too fractured to outlast its rival. He said this in October of 1956, the distressing fact is that the West's concept of freedom today is not one, but many. The free world defends the dignity of man, but its agreement is mainly negative against the communist view. It is not at all unanimous on the meaning of human dignity. The same charge may be leveled against the lack of a single definition of such everyday terms as democracy, free enterprise, and capitalism." Unquote. Opposing the totalitarian philosophy coming out of Moscow and Beijing, which Henry described as being categoric and precise, the West had only secularized residuals of an earlier Christian worldview. In place of this stunted philosophy of purely negative and individual freedom, he suggested instead the primacy of God's revealed will, saying, the fate of freedom is suspended in the last analysis not on the alternative of the individual orientation or the state orientation of conscience, but on the Godward orientation of the individual and the state alike. Although he did not look back into the, some mythical golden age of American history when everyone was a good Baptist like himself, or a Presbyterian like me, perhaps better, he did see in the, founding, in the nation's founding a reliance, upon, <laughs> a reliance upon ideas and principles which found their ultimate source in a theocentric view of the universe. As he said, the theme of human freedom throbbed blood fresh in the veins of America's founding fathers. Alongside the titanic brutalities of our own time, the tyranny they deplored was perhaps only the shadow of sorrow. Nevertheless, they appealed to the one eternal preserver of man's responsible existence, the almighty guardian of the dignity of man and definer of the powers of the state. Closing out the same article, Henry derided the attempt by the United Nations and many American diplomats to fashion a human-centered uh, basis for liberty and dignity. In that case, the strivings of the Cold War would become nothing more than two brand names of the same tyrannical powers. As he put it, for if the UN is the source and sanction of human rights, there can be no appeal to a source and sanction higher than the UN. In that event, the conflict between the Soviet orbit and the United Nations reduces to a conflict between superstates. Henry did not call for advocacy of the American position simply because it was his side. Instead, he called upon America and its allies in the UN to root their fight, quote, in the fact that man bears by divine creation a unique dignity and that the state and citizen alike are bound in a responsible way to the living God. It was only in conformity to the revelation of God that human flourishing could become manifest. One of Dr. Henry's uh, Christianity Today articles uh, combined his concern over communism and the dangers posed by the possibility of nuclear war beginning with a swipe at what he called the, mad, the, sorry, the world's mad arms race, Henry lamented the decision by General Secretary of the Soviet Union, Khrushchev, to restart nuclear weapons testing. He warned that with new, quote, super bombs, the Russians could rain death upon any spot in the globe. He wrote of Khrushchev's actions in the following manner, attacking both the communists and those in the West who downplayed the threat. He said, the only language the power-hungry naturalists have ever understood is the language of more power. The fact that Khrushchev's rocket-rattling surprise and shocked the Western leaders only indicate their naive understanding of the history of thought and the nature of man. Khrushchev made it clear that strongly worded phrases with Harvard artiness hold no terror for him. In light of this perceived new level of aggression, Dr. Henry called for a vigorous response. But he couched it in terms encompassing the moral complexity of the situation. He began with a comment which could have been found on the lips of the most ardent pacifist. He said, Christianity is a religion of peace. 
The church has no mandate to fuel the arms race. It must nourish the believer's aspiration towards constructive thought and life and guard against sweeping man's energies into the service of irrational impulses and resentments. Yet this was followed hard upon by a more bellicose and eschatologically focused corollary. He said, no century in history provides a clearer evidence than ours that the virtues of peace and justice cannot be superimposed upon an unregenerate human nature. The answer to the problem of the human race is a new society of regenerate men and women. If the church must remind the powers that be, as indeed she must, that the only deterrent to slavery is the use of force in the service of justice, it must also remind the children of this age, as the biblical writers do, that enduring peace has messianic roots and that it deals not only with the political tensions, but with uh, both the grip of sin and the stench of death upon our spirits. Henry here speaks mournfully about the possible necessity of nuclear war, while adamantly declaring that no war or political process can fix humanity's ultimate need. No human system, capitalist American or Soviet Russian, uh, will solve the dilemma facing the world in his day or any other. Now moving on to God, Revelation, and Authority, uh, can you continue to deal with many of these same themes? though now a nuance with a more philosophically and theologically minded audience. Perhaps the only notable shift uh, concerning these subjects is that Dr. the Dr. Henry of the 1970s and 1980s was even less inclined to speak positively about America and the West. To those Christians in the United States, confident of their favored status, he offered the following rather shocking critique. The superficiality, especially of American evangelicals, often prompts them to view prosperity and public acclaim as the faithful believer's expected lot in the world, rather than as a providential privilege involving awesome national and global responsibilities. In another passage, he placed the United States and its allies on the same plane as its geopolitical rivals. Quote, while the New Testament sets God's final judgment on the future, it does not limit that judgment only to the distant hereafter. Jesus Christ, the divinely appointed agent in the final judgment, is even now active in the rise and fall of nations, including modern China, England, Germany, Israel, Korea, Russia, and the United States. Now, lest this be confused with some kind of token and toothless admission that America is another nation just like all the others, Dr. Henry offered some more specific criticism in a later volume. He said this, the important struggle between the so-called free world and the totalitarian world becomes increasingly reduced to simply a conflict between the personal desires of the free, rational self and the compulsory demands of a collectivist society. In time, both forces, even if in different ways, come to reflect the very same revolt against the transcendent divine authority. Even in the United States, despite widespread belief in the God of the gaps and a blessed immortality come what may, the nationalism of democracy frequently slips into a kind of political atheism that accommodates only the rituals of civil religion that in fact actually conceal the decline of faith in the schoolroom and in the inner city. Even more pointedly, and certainly more shocking for Americans tending to think of themselves in a superior moral category to the rest of the world, all the other nations out there, Dr. Henry included, that the land, included the land of the free with a rogues gallery of 20th century human crimes. In a single paragraph, he railed against structural sins such as economic oppression of migrant workers in Latin America, anti-Jewish measures in the uh, Soviet Union, the apartheid system in South Africa, and the Nazi atrocities. And then there, right in the middle of all these horrors, he included the American denial of civil rights to African Americans. To this long-standing American crime, he added the then-recent crisis of abortion and related issues. He said this, in our time, a deviating democracy legalizes what a generation ago would have seemed the prerogative of only the cruelest of tyrants, namely millions upon millions of abortions. And in our so-called civilized society, certain intellectuals discussing acceptable conditions for infanticide and euthanasia consider such acts to be for the social good and dignify them as mercy killings rather than murder. Now, when discussing nuclear weapons in this work, Dr. Henry retained his gloomy image of their possible use. Interestingly, in these works, his discussion of atomic weapons comes most often in conjunction with other fears facing uh, society in the 1970s and 1980s. In 1976, he wrote, except for the fears of nuclear destruction that would return the earth once again to a desolation and a waste, contemporary references to a possible curtain for human history occur usually in terms of some dire nat uh, natural calamity. He further suggested that the possibility of such a cataclysmic 
uh, event was becoming, uh, becoming reality was even more likely, given the world's moral sense wandering about looking for a new home. He said that after the, ex the scientific experiments of the Nazi era, the, the, having, this moral, having this moral lostness could not be tolerated with nuclear weapons in tow now. Perhaps the closest that Dr. Henry came to supporting the possible use of nuclear weapons in uh, God Revelation Authority was in the midst of his criticism of the pacifism as espoused by John Howard Yoder. Very broadly speaking, Yoder had argued that the ubiquitous horror intrinsic to war uh, precluded any Christian participation in the military. To this, Henry uh, countered with an admission of the moral quandary brought upon the Christian conscience by modern war but said that the pristine ideals of those in the comfortable West did little, th did little for those living the, under the thumb of systematic oppression elsewhere in the world. He said this, the matter of military participation or non-participation is of course critically important in the tension in for the tension in Christian ethics is nowhere more anguished than in regard to war. In either case, whether it takes up arms or refuses to do so, the church seems to cloud its mission. This becomes all the more true since modern nuclear weaponry harbors the possibility of such monstrous destruction of civilian life and ecological values, what armed conflict achieves by restraining injustice often seems to be sacrificed in the disorder that follows. On the other hand, the victims of unresisted tyranny grieve for the loss of human freedom and dignity. It was because of this, the severity of this tyranny, as he saw in the communist world, uh, that Henry was so opposed to Marxism. It comes across as a dangerous philosophical error and an affront to human dignity, mo dignity more than being simply a geopolitical threat to the United States. Marxists failed to see the inherent spirituality of human beings. Uh, and he said of them, the communist attempt to eradicate religion on the flimsy pretense that it is essentially an opiate of the masses reflects an unrealistic analysis of man and society and its violent hostility was foredoomed to failure from the start. Henry was just as insistent in his condemnation of the tyrannical nature of communists in this later time of detente with Nixon and Kissinger and et cetera, as he had been during the time of the Red Scare and times of uh, McCarthyism. To the Marxist claim that they had been, they'd been creating a classless society, the, um, he, he, Henry countered, instead of fading away, the Russian state has hardened into an iron-fisted totalitarianism that imprisons millions of its countrymen in prison camps. In the interest of efficiency, its social structures have been modified in the direction of a primitive state capitalism. Its new race of humans exists not in a utopia, uh, but uh, under rigorous censorship, political controls, internal pa passports, and threatened deportation to Siberia for dissension. Or again, in, in an age of totalitarian political atheism, may spare neither devout Jew nor devout Christians. We should remember that so far in our century, totalitarian tyrants have already sacrificed tens of millions of humans. Hitler destroyed six million Jews and six million non-Jews. Stalin is charged with killing 15 million persons and Mao 30 million, unquote. In this way, Dr. Henry grouped the two titanic figures of 20th century communism, Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong, with the era's most notorious dictator, Adolf Hitler. So now what do we see, what have we seen, as we have skimmed, and I do emphasize skimmed, uh, through the works of Dr. Henry on these issues? What kind of themes or principles can we discern? Well, I think the first thing that should be obvious is that far from the caricature of, uh, found in many analyses of evangelicalism, his ideas on national security were in no way uncritical or simplistic. In fact, at times he is being self, he, he almost seems self-contradictory more than he is being exe exhibiting uh, a lack of nuance. After all, it seems troubling that he would, would be offering theological cover to a nation as rife with sins as he himself said that America to be. Perhaps it is seemingly, more, it seems morally compromising that uh, not only to do this, but to call for the deliberate destruction of Russian cities, not just military forces, but cities provided the right global situations happen to be in place. However, I would suggest to you that rather than this being a contradiction, what we see here is we see Henry right in line, so him being indicative of being right in line with the practices and principles of the Christian church going from our own time back to the earliest centuries. Look to the Reformation era. 
The 16th century was, they did not have the vastness of destructive power of weapons that we have today. No aircraft carriers and no nuclear weapons, but they had their fair share of wars and then some. And Martin Luther witnessed much of this. He could say in his treatise, whether soldiers too may be saved, he said this, when I think of a soldier fulfilling his office, punishing the wicked, killing the wicked, and creating so much misery, it seems an, un, it seems an unchristian work completely contrary to Christian love. But when I think how it protects the good and keeps and preserves wife and child, house and farm, property, honor, and peace, I see how godly this work is. And again, he said of war, the small lack of peace called war, or the sword, must set a limit on this universal lack of peace, which would destroy everything. He expresses the same sort of complexity, on the one hand, hating war, but on the other hand, acknowledging its necessity given the circumstances faced. A millennium earlier, Augustine of Hippo, who also, I mean, after all, he died in, while his city was being besieged by the Vandal uh, tribes. He could, Augustine could compare the governments of the world, famously, to a group of bandits that had simply grown in number and territory and extent until they decided to call themselves a kingdom. He could also say to those, many of them Christians, praising the way that the Roman Empire had brought civilization to the world, he could say this, true enough, but at what cost? There is one war after another, havoc everywhere, tremendous slaughterings of men. Yet, despite this and Rome's other ample cultural sins, he did not lead, this did not lead him to oppose his nation's foreign policy in and of itself. He encouraged one military officer whose wife had died and he was now considering entering a monastery. He, can, he told him that he should, stick, he should stay to his post. And my notes just went out, so we're going to go to the paper notes. He encouraged him that he should stay at his post, arguing that, the, uh, that while the monks might have uh, fought invisible enemies, soldiers fought physical enemies. Let's see where I was on the notes here. Okay. Uh, we see here in Luther and Augustine and Carl Henry alike, I would suggest that what we see is this complex view flowing from the result of three classic Christian doctrines of original sin, the image of God and man, and the authoritative revelation of God. Now we see original sin in Dr. Henry's writings most often when he is discussing the United States. For whatever good America might have, it was foolishness to try and establish liberty on the basis of unregenerate people. The people in America were sinners and they could not, on the basis of simply being American, establish true liberty. <coughs> Excuse me. Whatever liberty, whatever ideals or systems we might put forward, these inevitably become increasingly rebellious towards God and destructive towards uh, humanity. In a related way, he emphasized that it was on the basis of the glorious image of God in humanity, in all of humanity, that protests could be mounted against communist nations' treatments of their own people, and were threats to do the same to others. Finally, throughout what we have seen today, is only on the basis of a Godward orientation that human flourishing could possibly be accomplished. And this orientation could only be found through submitting to the authoritative revelation of God as found in the Bible. Because human beings are caught up in their father Adam's original sin, and the Sith sin of the garden has infected every one of us alive today, we can give up on the quest that we will find that one person, one ideology, or one state that is so stainless that it can be trusted with all of our hopes and dreams. We can further give up needing to go into denial every time we find that our nation, our system, or our latest hero fails to live up to our, uh, our moral expect expectations. In the same way, because we all share equally in the divine imprint, Imago Dei, there is a value in humanity that is not rendered by any state, nor can it be erased by any totalitarian system. Those on the other side of an international border have rights as human beings which, when denied, demand our condemnation. Those on our side of that same border have a significance and value which warrant genuine willingness to risk life and limb to protect. The value of humanity permits and even demands extreme measures against those who would desecrate it. And finally, because we live in a world into which God has spoken, a world where, as Francis Schaeffer put it, he is there and he is not silent, we are not left in the quagmires of moral relativism, unable to distinguish the significant, genuine corruption of the West during the Cold War with the systematic enslavement as practiced by the communist powers during the same period. When faced with a maelstrom of international conflict, we may be assured there is one place which we may turn, which overrules the competing voices clanging in our heads for our loyalty. 
our understanding of human frailty and human dignity find their sure source in the authoritative revelation of God. The choice before Carl Henry in this period was not between the good and the bad, but between the bad and the worse. I leave you today with one final quote from our hero. In November of 1979, he was addressing a church conference in Arkansas. It's interesting because this is just one year for the, for the famous uh, 1980 election uh, realignment where evangelicals became so much more active. And he said about this uh, on the topic of uh, priorities for the 80s, referring obviously to the 1980s. He offered the following statement when, cha when challenging the optimistic predictions of the future of evangelicalism and of the United States. He said this, I'm bullish on America too compared to some of the alternatives. But I'm also bearish when I read the word of God and measure it to the contemporary drift. The ethical response of the Christian to national security concerns is to temper our patriotism with class the classical Christian doctrines of original sin, the image of God, and the authority of divine revelation. By applying these ideas to uh, a situation in front of him, Carl Henry managed indeed to be a principled patriot. Thank you.